I'm Taylor. And welcome to Square Mile of Murder. Uh, it's October, so yeah. all things spooky. Yeah. Was it Yay. October last week? It was. I think it might be been October 1st. No, that's not right then, is it? Yes, because we're reco- think of what day we're recording oh, yeah, this. We're like, we're, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was. We're, we're early again, which we're... is good. <laughs> How did that happen? How <laughs> did that happen, honestly? <laughs> I'm impressed with us. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, this week, we've got a case that I have been fascinated by it for a few years now, since I first learned about it. It's not technically a true crime case. It's very much sort of flirting with the boundaries of true crime. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's our show, and we make the rules. Yeah. So it's definitely a creepy mystery, so it's perfect for Halloween. And I do love that in the autumn, we just kind of shoehorn all the mysterious things that we're interested in aren't technically crimes yeah <laughs> but like just shoehorn all these into like october or halloween yeah well wh- um, there was a oh like look it's fine because we accidentally don't do crimes all the time remember yeah. when we did the lottery <laughs> hackers and i wrote the entire script and then realized there's no crime here it's just <laughs> a great story that didn't yeah, stop it's... us so <laughs> I mean, we, d- we did kind of frame it a bit like it feels like it should be a crime, but yeah. it's not. But like... What else have we done? This... I mean, the whole month the of ghosts. ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> it's maybe one. <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah. Evidently. Um, Look. We are the epitome of our show, Our Rules. I so... mean, you're not here for consistency, because if you were... <laughs> You would have left by now. Yeah. Let's be um, real. Wh- whatever you're here for, we're, we're glad to provide it. Yeah. Let us know um, what that is, because honestly, at this point, I'm not sure. <laughs> and uh, we're tired. We're both sober today. Oh, yeah. That's no fun. We we weren't last time, were we? Was it last time or the time before? Wh- whenever the uh, uh, the the blue, blue men mermaid oh so that's a couple of weeks ago yeah. that was the flan the flannel the flannel the flannel, <laughs> the, the flannel sheets mystery <laughs> the flannel pajama pants mystery but, but now because since we have to do all our recording on a night now because yeah. you went and got yourself a full-time job like how dare you i know we we should just drink on a night honestly you know after 80 this is 87 episodes plus however many other things Bonuses we've done and patreon and- yeah like the fact that we haven't descended into just like drinking our way through these is kind of impressive so i mean like i think we should do that for like our christmas bonus episode instead of doing an actual case we should just get drunk and just chat shit i mean yes we could have if we could ask we if everyone sends us a couple of prompts yeah, of we things need, to talk about. <laughs> we need something to go on, I think. <laughs> just some direction. Yeah. But yeah, so basically, like, we're just quite clearly flying by the seat of our flannel pants and uh, doing whatever the fuck we want. Yeah. So yeah, with all that garbage out of the way that Taylor's going to edit out. At least some of it. <laughs> um. This week, it is the story of a haunted house where the haunting is not actually being done by a ghost. It is The Watcher from Westfield, New Jersey. So over to Taylor to tell us some more. I will just say, I feel like I'm okay with hauntings done by ghosts. I don't like the sound of hauntings not by ghosts, because that either implies humans or like demons or zombies or something terrible. So I'm not, I, already, I already don't like this episode. Just going to put that out there. <laughs> not a fan. Oh, and it's recent. Because we start out in June 2014. So are you basically saying you don't like it when I go off and do my own thing and then say, hey, this is what we're doing this week? No, I don't like it when things are creepy and too close to home. Too real. <laughs> 
not if it like uh, we will never do that case where the guy like lived in someone's attic nope nope exactly nope. that is the that the, the possum in the walls i can't that i can't do no so like that freaks me that no this is where i get a little <sighs> but we're doing it mm-hmm. it's fine it's fine so yeah june 2014 not that long ago Derek and Maria Broadus were preparing to move into their new home at 657 Boulevard in Westfield, New Jersey, with their three children. Now, if Westfield, New Jersey sounds familiar, that may be because it was the home of the List family. Our, our good old buddy, John List. Um, and close to Springfield Township, which you might remember from last week, which is where Jeanette De Palma lived. So we're just really going after New Jersey on this show. It's about time. Let's be real. <laughs> uh, yeah, but okay, there there are good things to have come out of New Jersey. No, Springsteen. Oh yeah, he's he's good. Like. That's my entire list is Bruce Springsteen. I've been to a hockey game in New Jersey once. That was the New Jersey Devils. They were okay. When I go visit our friend in New York, I will probably fly into Newark because it's probably, well, sometimes it's coming up cheaper. So oh. Now that is not something good in New Jersey. Newark is terrible. Just terrible. <laughs> Do not recommend. Go to JFK. It's it's fine. Don't go to Newark. Anyway, New Jersey. So 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 we're still one and done on New Jersey. Spring Bruce Springsteen is our only good thing. I mean, yeah. Look. Oh no. Mm. They have Wawa's in New Jersey. I'm into that. They have they have what? what? Wawa. It's a it's like a, a gas station food chain, but they have really good sandwiches. Okay. Dave, I've also been to a Six Flags in New Jersey that was pretty good. So we have Six Flags and gas station sandwiches, sandwiches. <laughs> and Springsteen. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's SSS. It. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> things seem to happen in this area of New Jersey. Yeah, not good things, clearly. <laughs> mm. Um,. Yeah, so Westfield is an affluent suburb. It's about 20 miles from Manhattan. And at the time, it was considered one of the 30 safest towns in the country. Uh, and the $1.3 million six-bedroom property was the Broadus' dream home. And yeah, so so that it was one of the 30, 30 safest towns in 2014. So, yeah. you know, presumably... It's not like we're talking about like the 60s here where like every suburban town was the, you know, safest town or whatever. No. Uh, according to an article by The Cut, which we will link in the show notes as usual, uh, this was all, you know, like legit, like American dream kind of stuff. Uh, Maria was from Westfield, but Derek grew up in a working class family in Maine and worked his way up in the insurance industry to become a senior vice president of an insurance company. Uh, before they moved in, they wanted to get a few jobs done in the house and hired some contractors uh, to get everything ready before they actually moved in. Uh, and there wasn't a lot of mail being delivered because they hadn't moved in yet, but one day a letter landed on the doormat addressed uh, in handwritten writing to, quote, the new owner. The envelope had no name, no return address, nothing at all to identify the sender, and the letter inside was typed. Now, I'm not sure if that's like typed on a computer or like old school typewriter, mm. like extra intrigue. Yeah. Um, the first two lines were innocent enough. They read, Dearest new neighbor at 657 Boulevard, allow me to welcome you to the neighborhood. It's nice. Mm -hmm. Bit weird, but it's nice. Mm -hmm. But then things take a strange and sinister turn. How did you end up here? Did 657 Boulevard call to you with its force within? 
uh, later 657 Boulevard has been the subject of my family for decades now, as it approaches its 111th birthday. I have been put in charge of watching and waiting for its second coming. My grandfather watched the house in the 1920s and my father watched it in the 60s. It is now my time. Do you know the history of the house? Do you know what lies within its within the walls of 657 Boulevard? Why are you here? I will find out. Nope. So yeah, that happened. Oh. And uh, I should point out that we couldn't find a full copy of the letter. So we're just using the snippets that have been reported elsewhere. I don't think any of like I don't think anywhere they've been like printed in full. Uh-huh. Um which I suppose is fair enough if they're still trying to identify who wrote them because anyone could if you printed the entire thing. Yeah. Like anyone could be like, "Oh yeah, it was me. Look, I wrote this entire thing that I memorized." Yeah. So, yeah. So far, this could have just been a prank from one of the Broaddus's new neighbors. Or someone else in town, or even some kind of like revenge or joke from someone else who wanted to buy the house but lost out to the family. But then the letter gets more specific. See, that's not what I want to hear. (laughs) Uh, The letter goes on to make note of the contractors who were carrying out work on the house. uh, And also warned them that renovating was a bad idea, which is not what you want to hear. No. Uh, uh, it also mentioned the family's car and Derek and Maria's three children. Nope. Uh, in the week before the letter arrived, the family had visited the house and Derek and Maria had chatted with their new neighbors and their children had played in the yard with some of the neighbor's kids. Mm. The letter referred to the children as, quote, young blood, which, you know, it could, could be like an adult trying to, you know, be down with the cool kids and all that jazz. As I'm sure the kids are saying yeah, these days. Yeah. Uh, hey, my young blood friend. <laughs> uh, don't know. Um, but it could also be how a vampire sees children, which based on the rest of the letter, you know, you can you can make up your own mind about where on that, you know, trying to stay hip with the kids to, you know, supernatural creep. Where on that scale that the letter writer actually falls on? We'll leave that up to um, you. I'm going for towards the vampiric end, but not quite a vampire. Okay. Okay. I'm excited. Maybe maybe a vampire in training. Like an apprentice vampire? Like, someone who knows they're going to be made into a vampire. So they're, like... Preparing? They're like preparing. Like, they know where the fresh blood is. God. I just don't... Also, if you were immortal, you'd run out of things to do eventually. So you just write menacing letters to the neighbors? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but was it delivered during the day? See, I don't know. Mm, so there you go. Uh, the writer goes on to say, quote, once I know their names, I will call to them and draw them to me. Uh, which, you know, is at best mildly threatening. At the very best. At the very best. At least mildly threatening. A lot more than that. Uh, and mm-hmm. the letter ends with a riddle of sorts about who the writer is. Here we go. Who am I? There are hundreds and hundreds of cars that drive by 657 Boulevard each day. Maybe I am in one. Look at all the windows you can see from 657 Boulevard. Maybe I am in one. Look <laughs> look out any of the many windows in 657 Boulevard at the people who stroll by each day. Maybe I am one. Welcome, my friends, welcome. Let the party begin. And it was signed, The Watcher cool it's not a party does not sound like a party no uh now interestingly enough the signature was in um a cursive font 
Well, so was it like hand signed or was it? No, so it was it was in a typed typeface. Yeah, interesting. But again, like you can get cursive typeface for typewriters. Yeah, as well as like obviously on a computer. Yeah. So yeah, uh, which is why we're not sure in what form it was written. Could be anything. Uh, yeah, so that was different from the rest of the letter. Um, and you know, we know that. Now that handwriting analysis is sort of questionable junk science, but um, obviously with the entire letter having been typed, there was nothing to go off of as to who wrote it, even with, you know, potential handwriting analysis. Yeah. Uh, the family were understandably freaked out by this letter. And since the watcher, uh, referenced themselves, their father and grandfather, as having watched the house. The Brodesses decided to contact the couple who sold them the house. The sellers were a couple who had lived in the house for more than 23 years. They'd raised their family there, they'd all moved on. Mm -hmm. So uh, They said they had never felt watched or unsafe in their home, and that they often didn't even bother locking the doors. Uh, but they did confess that they had received a note signed from the watcher, shortly be before they moved and this is where sources vary because some say that they received it just a few days before they moved out mm -hmm. which would obviously be when you know they had sold the house the paperwork would have been completed they would literally be moving out mm -hmm. about to hand the keys over but others say that they received it before they put the house up for sale and some even go as far as to like suggest and imply that the letter was the reason the previous owners decided to sell. Mm. So, but it seems to be that it was just before they moved out. That seems to be the most common version of events. Uh -huh. um, the couple said they just dismissed it as something odd and threw the letter in the bin without thinking any more about it. So we don't actually know what was in that letter. Probably nothing good. Say that much. Uh, the two couples went to the police to report the letters, but the police, according to some sources, uh, didn't really take it too seriously, and nor was there a lot for them to go on, even if they did take it seriously. Uh, but they did tell the couples not to tell anyone about the letters, especially the neighbors, because all of their neighbors were now considered suspects. Yeah, so sending, sending letters like that... It is interesting as to what crime you can actually be prosecuted under. I wonder... It's a psycho psychological threat. I wonder if there's some sort of... So was it posted? Like, did it go through the mail system? See, this is what I couldn't find out. Is whether or not it went through, like, the just a normal mail or if it was hand-delivered. Yeah, because, like, if it did, like, if it was postmarked and processed through the U.S. mail, there might be some sort of federal statute there that you've brought like mm -hmm. sending menacing communicate i don't know but like i feel mm. like there's all of these laws around the mail that like people don't even realize exist and aren't actually like serious federal crimes <laughs> yeah so yeah but yeah that is it's a it's kind of a weird one Two weeks after the first letter was sent, the Broadus family received a second letter. And this second letter was addressed to the Broadus family, unlike the first, which was just addressed to the new owners. Um, and uh, the second letter mentioned the three children in birth order and by their nicknames, not their real names. Nope. Uh, so this meant that it wasn't someone who'd gone through public records or done like basic snooping on the family somehow they had actually learned these personal details about uh, the family and <laughs> there were also more references to the children as young blood uh, and the watcher thanked the broadises for bringing the young blood to them cool one thought about that not about the the young blood about the the names mm -hmm. so Maria, the mother, she was from the town and her family only lived a few blocks away mm -hmm. or a few streets away. So 
if they were well known in town, which it sounds like they were fairly well known um, from reading about this case, mm-hmm. it might not even have been that difficult to find out. Yeah, especially like things like that. If the if the grandkids like hung out at the grandparents' house, and you know how yeah. grandmothers are, they like to gossip all around town about such and such little. Timmy did mm-hmm. when they stayed over at my house the other day. Yeah. So I I could see that like getting around potentially. Uh so not only all of this, but the watcher was living up to their name and had clearly been watching the house because they mention watching uh the family unload their belongings and talk about the Broadus's daughter who uh, a few days earlier had been sitting on the porch painting at an easel. And the letter asked, is she the artist in the family? If the Broadduses had been able to shrug off the first letter as a prank or some kind of sick joke, they certainly couldn't shake off this second letter, which seemed to have you know, intimate knowledge of the family. So Derek and Maria began to feel suspicious of all their new neighbours, and they stopped all the construction work on the house, paused their plans to move in, Um. They didn't even take their children to the house anymore. Uh, Three weeks passed, and a third letter landed on the doormat. Now, like we said, we haven't found the full version of these letters, but it seems that this letter was a lot shorter. It hasn't been quoted at length, Mm -hmm. so we don't know. But the main crux of this letter was, Where have you gone to? 657 Boulevard is missing you. Don't know if there was much before or after that sentence, but that's it. Now, after this third letter, the family once again contacted the police, and the investigation did seem to pick up a little. The police identified a neighbour who would come up again and again as a suspect over the years, but we'll move on to the suspects in a bit. Uh, The family also contacted private investigators, security firms, and even ex-FBI agents in their search for answers about who the Watcher was and what they wanted. Uh, One of the ex-FBI agents they contacted, according to an article by All That's Interesting, was Robert Lenahan, uh, who they asked to do a threat analysis on the letters to help develop a profile of the writer. I believe he had something to do with researching, um, investigating and prosecuting uh, organised crime in New Jersey. Mm, okay. Yeah. So Robert Lenahan uh, concluded that the writer didn't appear overtly threatening, but their obviously erratic thoughts could suggest unpredictability. You don't say. Uh, he also said that the writer was likely an older person, and this was because of the vocabulary they used, and they double spaced after every full stop. Mm, yeah. Which is. Like an old typist yeah, thing. Yeah, it's like a typewriter thing. Yeah. Yeah. An unpredictable, erratic, elderly person. <laughs> yeah. Great, just what you want, right? But despite all these efforts, all these experts that were brought in, no real progress was made on the case, beyond a few kind of vague suspects. So six months after the first letter arrived, the Broadduses decided to put the house back on the market, this time for $1.4 million, uh, which is owed to the uh, construction work that they had done. Supposedly that added $100,000 of value onto what they had paid for it. What on earth did they do to it to add $100,000? They add like a fucking indoor pool or something like what (laughs) i mean to be fair it sounded like they were doing a lot of work to it to like be out of the house for you know to wait you know three weeks four weeks to move it so i don't know but look once you get into that kind of pricing in residential real estate it's all made up anyway it's like well that's true oh you've replaced the tiles with travertine have another hundred thousand dollars 
With what? Travertine. It's like an expensive, like, I think it's a marble tile oh. type. It, it was very popular in the early 2000s and in all the, like, home renovation shows. And now it's, you know, oh. terribly passe, so. <laughs> I watched too much HGTV this weekend. I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like... They probably didn't put $100,000 worth of work into it, but probably some some real estate agent was like, yeah, that new hardwood floor you put into the dining room is worth an extra $0.1 million. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. And the, the, the worth of properties is all relative anyway. It's oh, the, the worth of anything. It's own something's only worth what someone is willing to pay. Yeah, and and if you're in like this this suburban area, like twenty minutes from Manhattan or twenty miles from Manhattan, yeah. you know you're attracting these kind of people paying like one point three, one point four million. Yeah, you know, for a house. Yeah, you can add an extra hundred thousand on for next to not, you know, for very little work, and people will pay it. I mean, like potentially even just in the six months that they hung on onto the house the housing market in the area was such that like the comps nearby were going for 1.4 million or 1.5 or yeah. whatever so like it is variable but yes so we're real estate agents now we'll we'll take a 30 percent commission please thank you uh that actually was a point I was going to make before we went off tangent. <laughs> off tangent? Yeah, we did go off. We went off the we tangent. We went on even. a tangent and then off said tangent. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, like, let's say any, you know, houses and anything of value is only worth what someone will pay. But it's in the interest of estate agents or realtors, whatever you want to call them, um, depending on what side of the pond you're on, uh, you know, any kind of broker or seller of like anything like that it's in their interest to bump the price up as much as they can as well because they get more out of yeah, it no for sure yeah so the neighborhood was a buzz with chatter about why the family had decided not to move in because you know like we said they already lived in westfield and maria was from or at least the yeah, area. general vicinity and maria was from westfield so they were known in the area so the Broadduses also disclosed the letters to prospective buyers, which led to uh, all of the potential sales falling through. So with the house seemingly unsellable and the family too scared to move in, in 2015, the Broadduses did the only logical thing <laughs> they could think of. And this is very American. Uh, they sued the previous owners for not disclosing the letter they received before moving out. Would like to point out, I did not put that it was an American thing in the script. Taylor added that on by herself. Oh no, I thought it, but I didn't write it. No, I, I added that. We're very, we're a very litigious people. I will say that, mm. Uh, mm. and it's fine, you know, because I've been looking at our numbers, and we have a higher percentage of UK listeners than US listeners now. For a while there, okay. we were pretty even, but I think we've offended enough of my people that they've, t you know. <laughs> tapered away <laughs> which is probably for the best because <laughs> they'll sue us if I, mean... know. <laughs> I love all of our american listeners hello fellow countrymen <laughs> i mean i you know offend the british as much as well so like that's the thing we give as good as we get so yeah you know it's fine but anyway yeah so they fucking yeah. sued them which is i did when when i read about that i was like <laughs> It's just, it's so American. <laughs> it is. But also, like, I don't know what I would do in this situation. Like, unless, I mean, I if I was desperate to get rid of the property and was financially comfortable, I'd probably sell it at a huge loss just to, like, dump mm. it. But I don't know. In their complaint, Derek and Maria claimed that the previous owner should have disclosed uh, the letter they received just... Uh, like they disclosed the fact that the basement sometimes took in some water, flooded a little, which 
Yeah. <laughs> I guess so. I mean... They're very different uh, scenarios, I, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, like, one... So I know, like, if someone has, has been murdered or something in a house, you... I don't know in this country, but I know in, in America you're supposed to disclose that, aren't you? And yeah. Things of, like, that kind of nature and things about the house. Yeah. You know, you're not supposed to sell it under deception. Yes. But, I mean, it could just be a coincidence that the day after you moved out, the basement started flooding, you know. If you've got one letter and you're like, well, it's odd, but... Meh, but whatever, yeah. Don't really care. And you throw it in the bin, like, you don't even think anything of it. Do you have to tell? No. Because it, it'd be one thing if, like, the entire 23 years they were living there, they were getting a letter a week from some creepy fuck. Like, that's one thing. But if it's just, like, a one-off thing, then it, it could have been anything. Yeah, it's like one of our neighbours has a temper tantrum about our hedge in the summer because it grows faster than we can cut it some weeks. Do I have to tell prospective buyers that? Never. Hell no. <laughs> yeah, No. They get to, f no, they can find that out for themselves. That's, well, that's part of the joy of home ownership. <laughs> yeah. And it's just kind of thing, like you say, it's just something you shrug off. Yeah, it's like, no, like it's not a big deal. With, with Hedgegate. Yeah. Um, this has been a summer long thing that I've been telling Taylor if, about. So. Uh, if you want to hear more about it, uh, it's in one of the rambles. Yes, I, it did. I can't remember if I told, if uh, I talked about it on one of the Patreon episodes, but yeah. It's like July um, or something. Sometimes one of those. It's fine. But yeah, it's something that's annoying and you roll your eyes at, but it's not. It's not like, yeah, something you should legally have to report. According to the Cut article, the Broadduses aimed to reach a quiet settlement with the previous owners, but a local reporter came across the complaint, and that was when it went from local gossip to a viral news story. Ah, uh, gotta love those local reporters. <laughs> uh, the complaint was thrown out by a judge in 2017, with the judge claiming that what it would set an unreasonable precedent for what sellers would have to disclose when selling a house. Amen, brother. I say. Or madam. But yeah, I... That, I think, is like unre an unreasonable precedent. Yeah, right? absolutely. If, if you have to disclose like one letter that came through your door... And also, because the sources vary, we don't know if they'd actually completed the paperwork, if the house was on the map. We don't know when this letter came. Yeah, so... Just like, what are you... But yeah, so like... And we still get, like, mail from the previous tenants in this house as well. And at this point, like, I do a quick glance over stuff, and if it's for us, great, it gets set in one pile. If it's not for us, or if it's junk mail, it gets set in another pile to be dealt with later and either written on, you know, return to sender return. Uh, or chucked in the recycling. So shouldn't have to disclose that sort of thing. Uh, but whilst this case was sort of rumbling on through... 2015 and 16 and into 2017 uh, the Broadduses attempted to convert the house into two properties mm. or at least obtain planning permission to do so in order to sell the house to a developer mm. uh, but there was a problem splitting the lot into two properties meant that each lot would be three feet too narrow for the neighbourhood's planning regulations <laughs> my knowledge of like American neighborhood planning boards comes from TV. Yeah. Are they as like draconian, sub stereotypically suburban nightmarish? Are they really like that? Depends on where you are, but they definitely can be. Like, especially places with like homeowners associations. It's right or like buildings with like co op boards or you know, condo boards or whatever, like, it can be very petty, very, like, strict and in stupid ways. Um, so the couple required exemption from the Westfield Planning Board in order to do this. Um, whilst family did have some supporters, 
There were plenty who did not want to see the neighborhood change in any way. I'm sure. Uh, which led to some interesting conspiracy theories. And you know we love a good conspiracy theory. In January 2017, the application was rejected. Uh, but the following month, the couple did finally get some good news. They found a family to rent the house from them. However, they had a get-out clause in the lease, and that ensured that if the watcher sent another letter, they could immediately terminate the lease. And that was when the final letter from the watcher arrived. So there hadn't been a letter since 2014, like just months after the couple had bought the house. This letter was addressed to the vile and spiteful Derek and his wench of a wife, Maria. Oh, yay. Uh, it went on to torment the couple in the same style as the previous letters, suggesting that maybe they knew the Watcher or had spoken to them at some point, and then threatened the family if they harmed the house in any way. God. Like, their planning permission has been rejected. What more? Ha what harm can they yeah, do? right? <laughs> yep, so, it said... Maybe a car accident, maybe a fire, maybe maybe something as simple as a mild illness that never seems to go away but makes you feel sick day after, oh god, day after day after day after day after day. <sighs> That's a lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's a lot yeah. of days. Uh, maybe the mysterious death of a pet. Loved ones suddenly die. Planes and cars and bicycles crash. Bones break. I like that they included bicycles. It's like, we're being inclusive here. Yeah. Mm. Uh, the letter ended. Yeah, even even environmental activists are in danger yeah, here yeah, as well. It's great. Um, the letter ended, all hail the watcher. Wow. So not only as has this weirdo escalated and clearly has gone a little bit mad with saying don't hurt the house and day after day after day after day after day after day like <laughs> we're now we've now got a bit of an ego going on here <laughs> uh, so due to the way the writer wrote about being familiar with the house the broadest is believed that it was someone who lived in one of the 10 houses in the neighborhood there's only 10 houses in the neighborhood. That explains everything. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice round number. They don't want it. Yeah, exactly. That would be terrible. That would probably be unlucky or something. Um, Yeah, so they thought it was someone who lived in one of these 10 houses, and they took the letter to the police. But again, there was no real movement made on the case. The renters moved out soon after, and they found some more renters to move in, although the rent didn't cover the mortgage for the house, which is not how you run a rental property. No. Although, extenuating circumstances. <laughs> yeah. No more letters were sent to the Broadus family. However, there were letters sent to others in the neighborhood in a similar style to those sent by the watcher. On Christmas Eve 2017, several families in the neighborhood received handwritten letters signed Friends of the Broadus Family. The letters were sent to families who'd been the most vocal in their opposition to the Broadus Family. And we don't know exactly what these letters said, but one of the recipients wrote on Facebook, I wish we could go back to the days of tar and feathers. I have just the couple in mind. Damn. Yeah, so that gives you some indication. <laughs> Holy shit. But, you know, hold on to your hats. Uh, Derek would later admit that he wrote the letters that were sent to the neighbours. Oh claiming that he was driven to his wit's end by the whole ordeal. And, you know, wrote them out of anger and frustration. Not a good one. <sighs> But this revelation just strengthened the conspiracy theory that we teased at earlier. And that was that the whole thing, the whole, the watcher, the let's everything, was orchestrated from the start by the Broadduses themselves. Hmm. 
By the time the planning board meeting came around, there were plenty in the neighbourhood who thought that Derek and Maria Broadus had set the whole thing up so that they could develop the plot, sell it on for a large profit. Um, but, you know, property is risk, as many in the neighbourhood pointed out to them, repeatedly, <laughs> reportedly. Both of those words. All of it. And one family's bad decision wasn't a reason to change the local planning rules. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So others questioned how even with Derek's, you know, very well-paying New York City insurance vice senior president job, uh, the family had gone from a $300,000 house to a $1.4 million house in just 10 years. And they had a $1.1 million mortgage. Wow. On this house. That is a hell of a lot. Yeah. There was another house in between, I mm -hmm. believe. But I can't remember. I think there was like half a million. But it's a that's, big yeah, step. Yeah, that's a big step up. That's that's a, that, that's literally a million dollars. Yeah. Over a million dollars in, in 10 years yeah. to have come from somewhere. Uh, and this led some to theorize that they'd basically gotten in over their heads and devised the whole Watcher saga in the hopes that the media attention would help ease any financial worries, you know, perhaps in the form of a book or TV or a movie deal. Mm, I could see that. There are, however, a few issues with this theory, uh, given that it costs them an awful lot of money with, you know, various construction work as well as the planning process, not to mention property taxes they would have been paying for a house they never actually got to live in. Yeah. Um, they also, according to an article on Ranker, which is linked in the show notes, turned down a number of movie offers, which, you know, defeats the whole object of the scheme. But they did send a cease and desist letter to a TV network for, because they had a program called The Watcher. Oh. That's interesting. Um, why would you send a cease and desist letter unless you were planning yeah, on... Yeah, doing something. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So, you know, they have never been charged with this. It's just a conspiracy yeah. theory. Think of it what you will. Allegedly. <laughs> uh, and with that out of the way, let's move on to the other suspects. Yes. Uh, so one suspect was a man whose girlfriend lived on the same street as the Broadus house. Uh, this man played some pretty violent video games and used the name Watcher. Uh, but this is all according to one police officer's memory. And although this man was supposed to come in and be interviewed by police, uh, he didn't show up. And because there wasn't actu any actual evidence other than a violent video game character named The Watcher, the police couldn't arrest him or force him to attend an interview. Fair enough. So, yeah. So there's a BuzzFeed Unsolved episode on this case, and they actually make a really interesting point about this sub uh, suspect. Who we don't even know this guy's name because there's that little evidence on him. It wasn't like it was never popularized or mm -hmm. like or publicized, I should say, like in the media or anything. It was just like almost bordering on hearsay at mm -hmm. this point. And that is that the point they make is that people who don't play video games or aren't familiar with video video games really misunderstand video games. Yeah. So playing a violent video game does not make you a violent person. Same way listening to heavy metal or watching horror films doesn't make you yeah. a murderer. Like, th just no matter what they tell you after every like violent incident. TVs, games, movies, music, it doesn't turn you into a murderer. No. They also say that there's, there is a video game called The Witcher, mm -hmm. which is, is very well known. So it's possible that it, this is like a big misunderstanding, given that there was never enough to like arrest this sub subject or like compel them to come in to interview or anything like that. Yeah. This could all be a very big misunderstanding. Yeah, I could totally see that. And yeah, The Witcher is very popular. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it didn't they even make it into a Netflix show last year, so. Oh, is that what that is? Uh, yeah. Oh. The fact that this is all based on some 
New Jersey cops memory. Yeah. Like, I'm pretty sure some middle-aged man in New Jersey could have seen something about the Witcher. And because that's a weird word, been like, oh, yeah, he, he was playing this game. He was the, the Watcher, you know? Yeah. Like, and it could be, like, innocent enough as well. Like, yeah. it's just a mistake. The other and main suspect who cropped up again and again was one of the Broadus's new neighbors, Michael Langford. Uh, Michael Langford lived with his elderly mother, Peggy, and other neighbors thought of the family as odd, but ultimately harmless. I'm sorry, when you have to put that as a, like, qualifier... <laughs> Yeah. That's not usually a good sign. Mm. Uh, but anyway, so Michael was diagnosed with schizophrenia as a child, but reportedly coped with it well. Although, according to his brother, he was sometimes spooked by new people moving into the neighborhood. The Broadus family home uh, would have been visible from the Langford family home, and the Langfords had lived in their home since the 1960s with Michael's father dying around 2002. And this would have fit the timeline set out in the first Watcher letter, if his grandfather and father watched the house before Michael took up the role for part of two decades, quote-unquote, as the letter claimed. Yeah, because the letter said that his father watched it from the 60s, and yeah. he'd watched it for part of two decades. Yeah. So, 12 years. So overlaps yeah. into two decades yeah it does in the right timeline it overlaps into three decades that's true <laughs> so it would fit but I, if they moved in in the 60s when did the grandfather watch that's yeah. my question that's yeah that's the only outlier um michael was interviewed by police and he claimed to know nothing but in the minds of the broadises it seemed that their minds were made up uh, with Derek Broaddus saying that when police told him there was no evidence, so nothing would likely get done, he responded that it wasn't good enough, and if they didn't do something, they would have a different different kind of crime on their hands. Mm. Uh, luckily for everyone involved, Derek did not murder Michael Langford, which is good. Yeah. So, as someone who has had threatening notes sent to their home before which I had death threats put through my door at one of the places I lived uh, in Glasgow. It's terrifying, it's frustrating, it's scary. It's, it's a, a million different things. Yeah. And the police were awful to me about it, but they're also limited in what they can do. They can't go and arrest someone just because you think. Yeah. No, and like, if 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 you don't see someone leaving the note, Mm. You know, like you said, there's not much to go on there, unfortunately. Yeah. But I, it never crossed my mind to go, to be like, I'm going to go and kill one of my neighbors who I think might have done it. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, and if, that's where I start to, to sort of lose sympathy. Just like not a good, not a good approach. Uh, Michael Langford was brought in for a second interview. But again, there was no evidence. So there was nothing they could do unless they got a confession out of him. Yeah. So they let him go. But his sister did accuse the police of harassment at that point. In an attempt to gather evidence, the envelopes were sent for DNA testing, along with the letters. And a saliva sample was obtained from one of the envelopes. But rather than leading the police back to Michael Langford, as everyone hoped and expected, mm -hmm. the DNA turned out to be from a woman. So police began to wonder if the DNA belonged to Abby Langford, and that was Michael's sister, the one who accused the police of harassment. Uh, Abby was an estate agent, or realtor, depending upon your geographical location. Uh, and some have theorised that the watch letters were sent by an estate agent who missed out on selling the house beforehand mm -hmm. and you know wanted to reacquire it mm -hmm. although the letters dro would have like driven the price down so the agent wouldn't have got as big a commission as they would have done had they sold it first time around but still still easy money for a couple of threatening letters yeah 
but all of this is speculation and it's kind of immaterial. Because just like her brother, Abby was not a match to the DNA recovered from the envelope. Nor have the authorities been able to find any matches in any DNA databases. And so the identity of the Watcher still remains unsolved. In 2018, the planning board approved an exception to the planning regulations that required a larger exception than the Broaddus' house just around the corner. Uh, but we don't know the details of that situation. But needless to say, the Broadduses were uh, angered by this larger exception and felt that they had been unfairly targeted not only by the Watcher, but also by the planning board. As well as the paranoia they both developed as a result of not knowing which of their neighbors was targeting them, Derek and Maria also developed depression and PTSD as a result of the letters and their attempts to sell the house. Uh, the Broaddus family finally managed to sell the house in 2019, but at a loss of between four hundred dollars and $500,000. And wouldn't you know it, that's the same year that Netflix reportedly bought the rights to the story. And that is the story of The Watcher. Thoughts? Any tangents we haven't been off on yet? Honestly, no. Mm. <laughs> um... I have, uh, like, it seems like it could be them, mm. but also that doesn't really make sense. Yeah. It's very strange. Yeah. And I, say, I have been in a similar situation. As I say, I did not have a million dollar mortgage at stake, but... <laughs> People react very differently in these situations, and yeah, that paranoia does stick with you for a long time. Yeah, I mean and it's a it's a formative life event. Yeah, um, and so, but like, can you fake that kind of? Can you like? Could you like fake that kind of trauma and all of that just to try and get like a TV or a movie deal? Yeah, but it's just so weird. Yeah, it's, it 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 is just weird. It's but just so weird. It it's very easy to argue every which way that it was. It was them. It was the family themselves. It was the neighbors. It was a an estate agent. It was. You know, it's so easy to argue it any which way. Um, it, it, yeah, I think that's the problem. Like, mm. yeah, I don't know where you, I don't know where you go with this one. No, and unless they manage to get like a hit on a DNA database, yeah, what are we gonna do? You're never gonna know. Uh, I would be interested to to know because I I don't know if because we don't know if they were hand delivered or if they went through the mail system. Mm -hmm. Like, so the the language used suggests it's an older person. Yeah. Some people do not like licking envelopes, and especially I find this seems to be old people are a lot like that. Like they will not lick envelopes. Yeah, I've seen like. People go to the post office and hand like open envelopes over and get the the postmaster to either lick them or to moisten the the glue so that it sticks. Uh huh. Did they? Could have they have gone to like a post office and handed it over? And the in this case, it would be a postmistress had just like licked it and yeah, it could be it. anyone. Well, and like. I don't know, sometimes if I don't feel like licking an envelope, I'll give it to whoever's in the house and just be like, mm. here, do this, because I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know about this case. It still seems like it could be a total fluke, like a prank. And yeah. Someone, someone just decided, oh, it's getting attention. I'm going to double down. Especially because they stopped after a while. Yeah, that's the thing. It stopped for like two and a bit years. Yeah. Um. 
So, so like my thought is like it was some teenager. They did it because it was funny, and it was mm-hmm. like the talk of the town. And then maybe they went away to school or just got bored, and then was like, "Hey, oh gosh, remember that funny thing I did? Well, I'll, I'll do it one more time," kind of thing. Yeah, but. I don't know. It's just weird. I don't like it. It's it's weird. Yeah, it's is it you could you could argue every which way as to who it was. Yeah. I would also be interested to see whatever this potential Netflix project yeah. like how it paints that especially if they've bought the rights off of the family yeah because if they've bought the rights that could be the end of it they don't have to include them in any kind of development of any project yeah and so yeah i'd be interested to see how how that turns out and how they how they're portrayed yeah you know who they think did it one thing that like stuck out to me is that the letter was typed so don't know if it was computer or rock typewriter but the letter was typed but the envelope was handwritten and that i find really strange that is weird especially if you're trying to conceal your identity well that's that's why like one of the reasons people if you're gonna send threatening letters you know unless you're gonna cut out all the letters from (laughs) a newspaper yeah typing it is the best way to conceal your identity and to then handwrite the envelope you then risk being identified unless that's part of like the thrill for you. Yeah, it is weird. The whole, th- I think that's the thing. The whole thing is like contradictory. What I find interesting about this case is like it's going to become like part of like local folklore, urban legend stuff. Mm-hmm. Like it has to <laughs> at this point. Like, yeah. And I just find it interesting because folklore as we think about it even urban legends just a lot of them are like quite old now Mm -hmm. like obviously there's like all the ancient folklore but sort of more recent stuff it's still 30 40 50 60 years old yeah and so i just find it interesting that it's kind of happening in real time yeah it's Um, kind of interesting to see it develop and to be able to identify the stories that are like ripe for the picking for future urban legends as they're happening. Yeah. And like, I think there's always this kind of assumption that like the old folklore and and legends and myths and stuff, they don't develop in this day and age because of like technology and surveillance state and everything like that. Mm Mm-hmm those things don't develop because everything is so easily explained yeah these days and and as well as like scientific development yeah. and knowledge and everything like that yeah so i yeah i just find it interesting to see what is essentially like folklore happening in in the modern age it kind of reminds me of like the the conjuring series like how mm-hmm. that was based on an actual was it yeah that was all based on like the amityville horror which was based on the the m- murder of was it De- defeo family murders yeah well the, the conjuring series is all oh uh, it's that couple who were paranormal experts isn't it yeah 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 and that's yeah and so it's it's all linked to this like real life event and real people but it's also taken on a life of its own in this like fictional world that ha- it has mm-hmm. its own sort of presence in the culture now i wonder if this is going to be something like that yeah guess we'll see in the yeah. next like 5 or 10 years <laughs> check back in with us <laughs> 20 years and see see what's yeah. happened. <laughs> yeah. So that's the watcher or 
we don't know if that's the watcher. Someone's the watcher. <laughs> um if you like the show as always be sure to rate and review us on your podcast app of choice especially apple podcasts um and subscribe to us so you never miss a new episode and uh we have merch it's cool it's related to this show that we do so if you want to get some show related merch you can do that uh by going to square mile of murder dot store or following the link in the show notes or on our website. And if you just can't get enough of the sound of our voices, I mean, <laughs> we love our voices. Obviously, that's why we started a podcast. But if you love them too, you can join our Patreon page, which also helps us cover the costs of making the show. Mm. Tiers start from just £1 per month. Every patron gets regular episodes one day early, a shout out on the show, priority case requests, and a lifetime discount on merch. And that's just for one pound a month. As the tiers go up, you get even more. Two pound a month, you get our ramble episode as well. Yep. Um, which, if you think this sounds crazy and, un and unscripted, the uh, the ramble is is totally unscripted. You haven't heard nothing. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, and you can find out a whole hedge story. Yes. About my, you, my unruly hedge. If you are, mm, there's mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> nope, 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 nope. <laughs> <sighs> Moving right along. <laughs> yeah. And as the tears go up, you get even more more episodes and some exclusive stationery merch that you can't buy anywhere. Yeah. So check all that out at patreon.com forward slash square mile of meta. Links are in all the usual places. So we will be back next week with another spooky Halloween story, I believe. Yeah, probably. Sounds right. Yeah. So we'll see you then. Thanks for listening. Bye. Thanks. Bye.